Tonight on NASCAR Race Hub, we visit with the pole sitter of the inaugural Brickyard 400, Fast Rick Mass. Also, the story of Rob Moroso, a young talent that left us too soon. Cousin Carl and Bob Osborne are splitting up. I'll tell you why it might be time for Jeff Gordon and Alan Gustin to do the same. No, not really. I'm no Chuck Woolery, but I've got some love connections. Drivers open up about their celebrity crushes. The Hub starts right now. Some news right out of the gate. Last night, the U.S. House of Representatives voted 216 to 202 to allow the various military branches to continue to spend money on sports sponsorships. In NASCAR, the vote primarily related to Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s National Guard sponsorship. The U.S. Army currently backs Ryan Newman and Stuart Haas Racing, but the team announced last week that the Army would not continue the sponsorship after this season. They will remain in drag racing. Look who I found, a couple of uh, ex-champions. Randy LaJoy, a two-time, I call it the Bush Series. So do I. Now the Nationwide Series champion and a two-time modified champion, Jimmy Spencer. You know, f first up, guys, we have the weekend off. The Sprint Cup Series guys do. It, it, how do you approach this weekend? I mean, the drivers are all in the Caribbean or in Rome, but, but how do the teams approach this weekend off, Randy? Well, I don't know about the teams, but when I drove, I wanted to go somewhere to race. And this is a big Oxford 250 weekend. That's one of the reasons that this largest short track race in America, I mean, back in the day when we used to run it, I mean, there was there was 150 cars come to this event. Up in uh, Maine. Up in Maine. Maine, yeah. Uh, the Bears track. And uh, that's something that uh, I would always look for an event to go to because if you got a weekend off, we're racers, man. We want to go to racing. Race teams, I've been to a couple of race shops, and they're kind of thin. So I think everybody's just taking a break before they have to go for the large run. But on the other hand, Spence, yeah, this is the last weekend yeah. off and then 17 in a row. But uh, I heard uh, Kenny Francis saying, we're gonna try and get caught up because we know this is the last off weekend. It's very important for them to get caught up for this treacherous schedule coming up for the, for the championship run the last 10 races but as a driver like randy said you want to race and i think that any driver out there like docks for 250 or the, the nascar e series any modified race anybody if they can get on tv and make a name for themselves bring recognition it helps them step up the ladder speaking of which you know we talk about the sprint up guys having the weekend off but the Nationwide Series and the Camping World Truck Series in action in Chicagoland, and, and that's a big deal. And, Jimmy, you told a great story about racing on an off weekend when an, a cup car owner, you caught his eye. Yeah, you know, I was actually racing for Dick Moroso in the Nationwide, well, Bush Series, and I agree with you. You can call it the Bush Series. And, yeah. and we had a heck of a car. We won the race the next day, Monday. Two guys call me, Bobby Allison and Buddy Baker. So thank God they were watching, and I think that still today is in effect. And, and you have the cup owner's undivided attention. Absolutely. I mean, ARCA too this weekend in Chicago. Good point. It, it's yeah. a speedway, it's a mile and a half. You need a mile and a half. Kids need a mile and a half to get okay to go to a two mile, two and a half mile. So they're all gonna go there and say, okay guys, let's do the best we can. And like I said, the cup guys are somewhere, the owners are. And, you know, if they get noticed, that'll be a great thing. And not to mention, we had your son Corey here a while back in the K&N Pro Series East. You're talking about yep. mm -hmm. they're in action in Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. That's right. And that's a great little facility. Uh, they do a wonderful job up there. Brand. It's small. Same gear as Bowman Gray. So okay. the kids, it's not a whole lot bigger. About the same as Langley. You know, and Corey won Langley. So we're taking the same car he won Bowman Gray and Langley with. And we need to get another W this week. I think the big thing about this East Series is that we're seeing uh, Chase Elliott run it. We've seen a lot of guys run it. And I think it's a great stepping stone for the, the craft. The, well, the camping world. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. I, I got you it. Got you got it. tools and, then, and beer. It's and, good. And that's right. Nationwide Series. So I think that, yes, NASCAR is working in that direction again. Yeah. All right, good stuff. Both these guys from the Northeast, and that's going to be important here. We'll tell you why. More to come on the Hub. We'll share the story of Rob Moroso, who is destined to be the next big thing in NASCAR. He was a natural. He was a modern-day Kim Richmond. And speaking of young superstars, has Jeff Gordon already outgrown his crew chief? Jimmy Spencer sets the record straight. 
and Jeff may have taken the Brickyard 400's first checkers, but he wasn't the first pole sitter. Who was it? Well, where are they now is next. Roll on, Big Hub. The name Rick Mast, for most, doesn't conjure up many notable NASCAR memories. A journeyman driver from Virginia who never won in the Cup Series despite almost 400 starts. He would say his shining moment was a sixth place finish in the 1989 Daytona 500. If you ask NASCAR historians, it would likely be when he sat on the pole for the inaugural Brickyard 400 in 1994. Mast retired after the 2002 season and currently resides in his hometown of Rockbridge Baths, Virginia, with his wife and three children. Funny, humble, kind, and competitive, the NASCAR career of Rick Mast unexpectedly came to an end over 10 years ago. With the Brickyard 400 approaching next week, we caught up with the man who was the very first stock car driver to make Brickyard history. Rick Mast is the latest in our Where Are They Now series. The clear calm of Virginia's Shenandoah Valley has healed the fuel-filled fog that cut short the racing career of Rick Mast. Where I grew up and raced here in the Shenandoah Valley, we were secluded from any other forms of racing. We were self-taught. It took the sale of a cow to raise the funds for a race car. That would define Mast's unusual arrival at the top level of NASCAR. The one thing that always humbled me was I was always in awe of being there. It, it, it never changed from the first moment I got my first NASCAR license till I, I was sick and got out of the car at Charlotte. I always felt fortunate to be part of this sport. I think when you have that mentality, you know, you look at it a little bit differently. When the door opened to race at the open wheel Mecca, NASCAR arrived in Indianapolis as eager and excited as Indy's race fans. It was big. Believe me, it was big. I mean, we knew about it for two friggin' years, man. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the famed Brickyard, where nine of NASCAR Winston Cup Racing's most famous drivers showed up on Monday and Tuesday to do what NASCAR claims was an unofficial Goodyear tire test. Congratulations to all of you for taking the time along the fences and, and uh, sign the autograph. They say it's not a common practice, so congratulations on that. In all the years after, I've never seen anything like that amongst the drivers, being excited about doing something like that. I just, I've never witnessed that. When qualifying concluded, it wasn't an Earnhardt or Wallace claiming honors atop the scoring mast. I didn't get rest the rest of the week in that city. I've never been blitzed with so much stuff in my life. You know, when I got out of the car and up until about 8 o'clock last night, then I kind of realized maybe this is a little bigger deal than what I give it credit for. Qualifying first became just the first step in fighting the Brickyard. Next step was fighting Earnhardt on lap one. I was riding on the car with Dale in the parade lap. Dale looked at me and says, Rick. I said, yeah. He said, can you believe all these damn people here to watch us? I mean, truly, Mr. Intimidator was awestruck, man. That's the thing that I remember about that day. Showtime's over, man. It's time for the race. Gentlemen, start your engines. Once the motor starts, you don't see people anymore. It's you and the machine and the windshield and trying to figure out how to outrun that guy in front of you. That's all that matters then. A new tradition begins. Earnhardt lost the pole. He's mad about that. I knew he was going to lead that first lap. As long as I didn't miss a shift or miss a gear taking off, I pretty much knew the only move that Dale could make to try to make it happen and happen in the first turn. And that's basically squeezed me hard as he could. And I was kind of prepared for that. Rick Mast has the lead as they come down the back stretch with Dale Earnhardt tucked in right behind him. Oh, he hit it pretty good. And that was his one move to make that happen. Rick Mast has become the first to lead a lap in the history of competitive stock car racing. And that's the first time he has ever led a first lap of any race. I was going to run hard for about four or five laps, and then I was going to work all day to try to figure out how to win this race without breaking anything. Come off the fourth turn, brrr, you know? So all that goes out the window. But uh, everything leading up to that was just so, so cool.
The Brickyard is not Mast's sole achievement. Family memories trump a 15-year career spent in a car, time that caused headaches and hallucinations from carbon monoxide poisoning. And we've already started running tests trying to figure out what in the world's going on with me. I've already been to the doctors quietly. This is something that's been going on for four months. And it's continued to get to where now I've lost 20 some more pounds. You know, I can't eat, I can't drink anything, I can't get anything down. So somehow or another, I, I, I just kind of knew when I got in that car that day, that was it. My racing deal was over. To be honest with you, probably 80% chance in my mind that my life was over. I mean, really, when I was sick, I didn't know what was going on. It took the Mayo Clinic to put the connection together. Uh, they said, we suspect a link to carbon dioxide poison. I'm like, what the heck is that? Our girls at that point, they were really too young to know, my little twin daughters, they were really too young to know what was going on. Ricky, of course, was old enough to know. They had to watch me adjust to a lifestyle I'd never had. When I was a teenager, I was gone chasing racing. All the bush years, gone racing. Cup, gone racing. You're always gone, you're never home. When I got sick, I was forced to stay at home for at least seven, eight months, okay? I had never done that in my life. I started to see a different side of life, and that's home life. Mass turned down a broadcast career when he left the cockpit. It was time to watch his daughters grow up, time to move beyond NASCAR. You know, we have a company at home called RKM EnviroClean. We do hazmat, you know, uh, emergency response work. RKM. But it's funny. You know, people ask, what are you doing there? I said, well, I got an environmental cleanup company. We deal with hazmat stuff. And they said, well, I thought you were sick off carbon dioxide. I said, well, I was. So, you know, normal deal, a little business, trying to make it, make it happen. It's just neat being a family guy, I guess. I asked Slick Rick once, I said, why are you so nice to everyone? I really admire that. He replied, hey, man, it's just as easy to be nice to people as it is to be a jerk. Now, that Sprint Cup win eluded Rick, but he won nine times in what was then the Bush Series. He was also on the pole for the Atlanta race in 1992 that was Richard Petty's last race and Jeff Gordon's first. Now, after the break, Matt Clark will join me to showcase some tools that have helped cut down the driver's intake of carbon monoxide. Later, we'll hear from Todd Bodine, who will make his 200th Truck Series start this weekend in Chicagoland, making him the only driver to have at least 200 starts in NASCAR's top three series. But first, drivers divulge celebrity crushes. Uh, I, I want to get to pick one. Mark back with us. And, you know, Matt, we talk about driver safety a lot. That's a huge initiative for NASCAR. But, you know, we talk about the Hans device. We talk about the safer barriers, softer walls. We talk about the roll cage. But one thing we rarely talk about is something that you can't see, touch, or feel. And that is carbon monoxide. Steve, they started in the early 2000s after the Rick Mass situation, really looking at what's going on in the car and they've done a number of things to the car to make it better for the drivers what they've done is they moved the exhaust pipe the exhaust pipes from the driver's side away from them to the right side of the car they've also made sure that the car has good ventilation and you see that with these NACA ducts they allow air to flow through the car and circulate but they also have made sure that that teams seal off the car when they build these cars are what they have called crush panels that meet the sides that are sealed off to block air coming through when you say sealed off what i think what you're saying is so that carbon monoxide heat etc cannot Correct. get into the cockpit of the car it stays pushes it out right you want that air stay, staying out and you want fresh air coming in the last drivers i remember wearing an open face helmet and now this is a motorcycle helmet but right. again similar to what drivers used to wear, Jimmy Spencer and right. Dale Earnhardt Sr. were the last to wear open face helmets, and it's changed entirely. Well, and what that's brought that evolution, I think it's a great job by NASCAR by mandating closed face helmets. And what we have here, Steve, is a cool box. This is the, uh, the latest and greatest that they use in the car, and this does a number of things well, for the driver. We think about driver comfort, getting right. cool air, but you say it's more than that. It is. It, it does cool the air for them. It blows on top of their head, but it also filters out debris and it also filters out carbon monoxide. So it's a way for them to, to mitigate the carbon monoxide getting to the driver. And Matt, we talk about the NACA duct. Right. 
that's here, and it would be in this area, right? And you see the hose. Right, they're all connected, and this right here allows the air to come in. It goes through the system, it cools the air. They're able to adjust the flow, how cool they want it to be on them. But when they close this up, they're getting fresh air as opposed to years and years ago. And got, you remember this, they had a term for it, Steve. It was called getting gas, and they accepted it as part of the job, but now I think NASCAR has really made it safe for these drivers. Well, and I remember to that point, Dale Earnhardt, right. Dale Jarrett, I remember Mike Skinner talking about getting headaches, and I'm guessing that's getting gas getting from gas. The carbon monoxide. Well, thankfully, it's something we don't have to worry as much about, but I would say this, it's something that we always need to keep in the back of our minds. Never get too comfortable being safe. Yeah, great stuff and uh, great visuals. Thank you very much, Matt. You know, it's hard to believe it's been over 20 years since Robbie Moroso tragically passed. We're taking you inside the rise and fall of a Connecticut kid whose life was cut short. And things have settled down a little bit, but think you know the whole story? Yeah, we'll see about that. Yeah, you've got the pressure on you, but you've got to just let that go and go do what you do. Speaking of Truck Series champs, Todd Bodine has two of them on his NASCAR resume. He won each of those with Jermaine Racing in 2006 and 2010. Todd's currently with Red Horse Racing and won in early June at Dover with that team. But the big story with Bodine this weekend is that he'll make his 200th career Truck Series start. It means that I've been around a while and, and a little diversified to be able to do it in all three divisions. You know, I, I, in this world, we all, we all want to do for a living what we love. We, we, we strive for that, whether it's a, a guy working in the yard as a gardener and a lawn guy or a guy working in a factory, loves his job. You know, we all want to do what we love. And, and I've been very fortunate for a lot of years and obviously a lot of races to get to do what I love to do for a living. And, uh, it's a great sport to be a part of and, and to be able to do it and earn a living and enjoy yourself. Uh, it's, it's pretty special memories. Lots more of that conversation between Ray Dunlap and Todd Bodine on the setup with Chris Devota at Chicagoland Speedway. That starts Saturday night at 730 Eastern. The American Ethanol 225 for the Truck Series rolls off just after 8 p.m. All right, so putting the hub together four days a week can be a challenge. The toughest part is figuring out, figuring out how to cut down an hour of great Rick Mass material into a five minute feature, but the cutting room floor gives us a chance to spread the wealth. Sometimes we're more lucky than good. We interviewed AJ Allmendinger's crew chief Todd Gordon before AJ failed his drug test. I think both of us hear a hear a TikTok. You know, it's uh, it's it's you, you you see your opportunities and and you, you know you need to make the most of the present. But at times, I think that can be destructive. So that's some of the things that we've talked about. Is you you gotta yeah you've got the pressure on you, but you've gotta just let that go and go do what you do. They didn't have very many cars in 1904. So they had to, to fill out the program to make it a full day of racing for the people. They had to intersperse some motorcycle races. The motorcycles were racing and they lined the next car. They forgot and they lined up the next car race on the front straightaway. Well, the poor motorcycle, the leader of the motorcycle race comes out of turn four. He's got his head tucked down, you know, in the aerodynamic tuck. He didn't see the car and he ran right into the back of the last car on the grid. Well, luckily the car he hit was a doctor's car. The doctor patched him up. The guy had a broken arm and he was okay. I taught um, uh, Hermie's sister, Missy. I taught Hermie and I taught um, Elliot. And I've never been a NASCAR fan until I had students that were involved with NASCAR. <laughs> Watch for Elliot and Hermie and listen to Elliot and Hermie as they talk on television <laughs> to make sure they speak correctly. I told Hermie one time uh, that I was listening to him, just checking on his English, making sure. I raced go-karts uh, growing up. She would come to the go-kart track and she would work in the concession stand. They would pay her 50 bucks. I could win the race and she still made more money than we did. So we used to play hide and go seek when I was younger. I would always run upstairs and kind of hide for a little while. And then when I heard him coming up the stairs, I would just climb over the balcony and, and jump off. So that was one of the 
things that kind of started, I guess, the daredevil side of me. Oh no, what is Jimmy Spencer up to now? You'll find out later. Now that's cleaning a windshield. And we've all had a celebrity crush at one time or another. You won't believe who some of the drivers have the hots for. Oh, well, there's plenty of them that I think are hot, but... <laughs> but next, he was dubbed as a possible superstar. We're taking a look back into the life and career of Rob Moroso. The name Moroso is one of the most recognizable in all of motorsports. Dick Moroso was a drag racer out of Connecticut who started an aftermarket parts company. He became very successful. Well, Dick and his son, Robbie, came to NASCAR in the late 80s. Robbie Moroso had talent uncomparable to people his age in any series. Tragically, his life and his career ended way too early. The crowd goes crazy, but they're cheering Robbie Moroso. He was almost Kyle Busch-like, doing things you didn't see other people doing. And the young 21-year-old driver wins for the third time in a row. He was a, a really nice-looking kid. I mean, the ladies really liked him. He could have been in Hollywood. Robbie Moroso, the biggest win of his young life. He was a natural. He was a modern-day Kim Richmond. What a tremendous talent. Rob Moroso was born in Greenwich, Connecticut, 1968. His father, Dick Moroso, who owned a successful racing parts company, supported his son's precocious driving ability. Dick starts Rob out racing carts and small cars and stuff like that, and the talent's there. So uh, Dick decides to move him up the ladder, much like uh, Jeff Gordon. The close re relationship between uh, Rob and his father is just unreal. His dad said it's just about as close as a son and father can get. He was trying to blossom Rob into being the next super guy. Moroso's rise through the ranks was swift and unprecedented. At age 16, he became the youngest driver to win in a NASCAR touring series. At 19, he was the youngest to win a nationwide race. One year later, he won the series championship. Moroso's rapid success put the racing world on notice. We didn't think people could compete in the higher levels and win until they were at least 25. I don't know if a 20-year-old, 21-year-old should win this, but these guys made it easy for me to do it. He is this freewheeling kid. He's supposed to be serious, and he just goes out there and makes it look easy. It is Moroso, Mike Walter, Moroso, Mike Walter, Walter is right there on him as they come up for. I know those older fellers that used to race in the Nationwide Series would look at him and say, what's this kid doing? He has the checkered flag. He's won the big one. He has beaten the seasoned veterans of the Winston Cup ranks. We began to see a potential Richard Petty or uh, David Pearson, it was inevitable that he was gonna make history. He's not afraid of, of any speed whatsoever. When you get a driver like that, you know you got a winner. You not only got a winner, you got a champion. We got the best crew in Busker National, they're a championship crew now, and that's all we can ask for to go win the cup. In 1990, Dick Moroso decided his son was ready to race full time in the Cup Series. The bright promise of NASCAR's next star attracted a new sponsor to the sport. Crown wanted to get involved in racing, and here's this young phenom. Crown Oil called him the Crown Prince. Moroso moves to the inside now, challenges Trickle as they come to the white flag. He had won in the Dash Series, then he moved up to the Nationwide Series, and he became the champion just in the second year. And then now he was in Cup racing for Rookie of the Year. Things were going exactly the way that I'm sure his dad envisioned it for him. Despite all the expectations, lackluster results plagued Moroso's rookie season. They thought we were going to be more successful than we were. We just didn't have a good enough team. We have a car smoking badly in the second corner. That would be Rob Moroso. For all of his maturity, you know, on the racetrack, he struggled to try to figure it all out off the racetrack, trying to understand how come it was so easy to, to race in Nationwide and why was it so hard to race in Cup. He had had a very successful career up to this point. And, and you're running in the back of the pack when you used to win in races. I'm sure it was frustrating for him. 
In September, at North Wilkesboro Speedway, another disappointing finish left Moroso searching for answers. He called me later that night. He said, he said, Bear, man, I'm, I'm sitting here crying, crying in my beer. He said, come down and talk to me. I was at home, and uh, they were down at a local restaurant. I went down there. It's about the only time I ever saw Rob down and out, and uh, I was a little worried about him. I said, Rob, come on. Come on, let's go back to your house, and we'll finish talking. Last time I talked to him. At 11 p.m. that night, in Mooresville, North Carolina, Moroso skidded around a corner and crashed into an oncoming car. Moroso and the driver of the other car, 27-year-old Tammy Williams, were killed in the wreck. Investigators determined that Moroso was driving over 75 miles per hour, and his blood alcohol level was twice the legal limit. His sudden death left the sport shaken. This one really hit me between the eyes. I couldn't believe it. Heard that uh, there had been an accident and Rob was killed. It shocked the racing world because we just lost our next superstar. 22-year-old Rob Moroso, the Bush Grand National Champion and the leading Winston Cup rookie driver, died late last Sunday night in a two-car highway accident. For a month after he died, it was like we just I mean, it seemed like we would expect him to walk in the door at any moment. We knew it would hit Dick big time, and it did. It was really, really tough on Dick. Robbie's death was really the end of him. He died in 1998 of cancer, but Dick Moroso also died of a broken heart. Had Rob Moroso lived, there's no doubt that there would be a battle over who had the most championships. I'm saying that, and it will be said for a long time from anybody who got to watch such a tremendous kid at that age and what he could do with a race car. We've seen other drivers his age or young drivers get killed, but none of them had shown that great ability up to that point. He was Hall of Fame bound. With all the wonderful things he had accomplished uh, on the track, it had been fun to see what the, uh, the last 21 years had been like for him. Well, I don't know how many races he would have won, and I don't know how many records he would have broken, but he's proved himself human. Randy LaJoy and Jimmy Spencer back with us, and I, I really don't know what to say other than everything you just heard was absolutely true. He you know, was going to be a superstar. And, and Randy, the LaJoy family and the Moroso family, you're both from Connecticut. You guys go way back. Yeah, my, my dad and Dick grew up together. My dad was an oval track racer, a Hall of Famer. Dick was a straight liner. And my dad says, Dick, you need to get into this oval track stuff. You know, there's stuff in his catalog. You know, Dick would always help people, you know, a little bit here, the Saturday night guys. They, and Ricky and, and Moroso still helped me and Corey. Uh, so that's something that, you know, when they Ricky were in Moroso, this, yeah. Ricky Moroso runs a company now. Uh, that, that company, when Robbie was here and Dick had that smile on, Dick was so brand loyal to everybody and, and yeah. all forms of racing. They all wanted to help Dick. They all wanted to help Robbie. And that's why, you know, they were building something very special there. Jimmy, uh, you know, Robbie, I remember the first time I saw him in a bush race at Darlington. He was running down the backstretch with Earnhardt, uh, Rusty Wallace. And I was like, that kid doesn't realize he's not supposed to be racing like that with them. I was uh, racing in the Nationwide oh, Nation. I was racing in the Bush Series at the time when Dick came along, and I'm like Randy, Dick was helping me in the Modifieds, and I had graduated to the Bush Series, and I was envious of the kid. I mean, the little rascal could do stuff with a car you were amazed with. And I was like, that rascal can drive a race car. Then he comes to Charlotte. He doesn't just kick the, Nate, the Bush drivers' butts. He beat Earnhardt, Jerry. He beat everybody three in a row. It's just incredible what the kid could do. You know, Randy, the word potential is easy to throw around, and we saw it, heard it in that piece. How good do you think Robbie would have been once he figured out the cup cars and the way the cup guys raced? As good as he was in anything he drove, uh, from the Dash Series to the Bush cars, I mean, just was so dominant. And he just tells you how hard the cup series level is. I want to say this, too, because you guys were in this era. When he won the championship in 1989, 
A 19-year-old kid, he was racing against Tommy, Tommy Ellis, Houston, yeah. Tommy Houston. I mean, these, Rick Mast, uh, Rick, yeah, that's these right. guys were veterans that knew what they were yeah, doing. Right. Jack Ingram, guys. Jack just, Ingram. They're the legends, Hall of Famers in the Bush Series day and age. Uh, Robbie come in there, and the, the, the coolest thing about Robbie was it, he didn't know that he was kicking everybody's butt. I mean, he was kicking my butt when yeah. I had my own car there. And it was, it, but he just smiled, and he was, every, he was everybody's friend. He and was. he did run into people. But it was hard. I mean, when I run into people, people grab me by my neck. But they couldn't grab me by the neck because he always smiled at the guy. I remember having a confrontation with him, and, and uh, I, I come to the hauler, and his dad was standing there, and I explained to him what he was supposed to do. Not, not to school him, but, and he would listen. Jimmy, okay, thank you. The thing that, you know, I, I was great friends with Dick, my sister. Uh, I, I got the drive for forever. Dick. Yeah. yeah, you'd won races for Dick. But the thing about Dick was is that Dick started his own engine department. He, he did all his research. Dick was a fine businessman. You don't come into this sport not being a fine businessman. We, we see the success that Roush has had. Hendrick, I believe that Dick Moroso would have had more than one cup team with Robbie and a champion. I believe he was the guy that could have went. And what, what uh, the reporter said, My, um, Myers, yeah, he, said Myers. It, he said it best. And I was driving for Dick when at Myrtle Beach, I won the race. I wanted to drive for Dick. And Dick is coming down. He was spotting for us, and he's crying profusely. My sister comes up and whispers in my ear what happened. Robbie Morosa won his first race at Myrtle Beach. Jimmy Spencer won the first race for Dick Morosa since Robbie had died. He hugged me, kissed me, and told me he can close the chapter in his book. I'll never forget it. Uh, I have a special relationship with Dick, and when he died, it, 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 it's, a, it's a loss in our sport that the people – can't replace. They were special people. Genius. I think the man was a genius. Yes. Well, guys, thanks for sharing your perspective, Randy. Appreciate it. I know you're, as I said, your families go back. Hey, good luck with Corey. This kid's Thank got you. potential. Oh, that's right. This kid's got potential. Grandpa was damn good. Randy, Corey, keep it up, buddy. Good luck. Hey, Spence, Thank you're you. not done working yet. Really? So just, just hang tight, would oh, you? Oh, man. Your whole hang, cigar break. <laughs> hang tight. Still ahead, should Cousin Carl consider doubling up on the weekends? I know one thing for sure. You're not going to believe what these drivers have in common. Pub's rolling. After this weekend off for the Sprint Cup Series, they go 17 weeks in a row before the championship is decided at Homestead Miami Speedway. So we're not going to talk about the chase today. Uh, but Danielle has a chase of a different kind. Oh, Steve, I like that one. We are chasing down love connections, lightening the mood, talking about matters of the heart on this off week. We wanted to ask drivers who's their celebrity crush. Who do I have a crush on? A celebrity? Um, celebrity crush would be... That's a good question. I always like uh, Eva Mendez. Yeah, I always thought she was hot. Sloan on Entourage. Taylor Swift is my celebrity crush. She's cute, she's famous, you know, she's a good singer. I'm a country music fan. You're not gonna play that one on air, are you? I think uh, Brooklyn Decker is uh, pretty good looking. Call me. <laughs> I, I want to get to pick one. I got a lot of celebrity crushes. You can always go with Carrie Underwood because she can sing and she's good looking. I really like Jennifer Love Hewitt. I've always liked her. You know, I was always a Jennifer Aniston fan, but, you know, uh, she's a little bit older, so. <laughs> I really like Erin Andrews. She's pretty cool. I like her. There, there's much more than just those two. How about that? Uh, Jessica Biel is really good. Celebrity crush. I don't know, like a Charlize Theron, uh, Scarlett Johansson. I don't know. Is that kind of like the blondes that are edgy like that? Krista Voda. She's hot. That's my celebrity crush, Krista Voda. Julianne Huff for a long time was, was kind of the, the girl. I was like, man, I'd like to date her. I can't remember the girl's name that was in Footloose here recently. She's pretty cute, too. Probably Julianne Huff, since I'm a country music guy, you know. He just said Julianne Huff yes. too. Cause see, last year, I went with Jennifer Aniston and so did he. Um, I forgot her name. My current celebrity, oh me. Kate Upton, is that her name? 
Um, Google her. You'll see why. My current celebrity crush would probably be Jennifer Aniston. Uh, Jessica Alba. <laughs> I don't have one. No. Oh, well, there's plenty of them that I think are hot. But <laughs> Amber Heard. She is not that well known, but by far the best looking girl in Hollywood. The current celebrity crush. Well, when I was a kid, my celebrity crush uh, was Leonardo DiCaprio. And that lasted quite a while. It's still there, probably. Oh, really? God, he's getting kind of old. Then the whole Twilight thing came with Rob Pattinson, so that happened for a while. Man, I don't know. But I go back to my tried and true Leo, you know? I think he's, um, he's pretty cute. Changes every day. I bet nobody else answered with that, that answer. How many Megan Foxes did you get? Angelina Jolie, Giselle. Oh, oh. Mila Kunis, she's hot. There's not one that's like, oh my God, you know, blows me away besides Sherry. Current celebrity crush would have to be my wife, uh, Lindsay Adams Hawkins Pastrana now. Uh, she uh, is, a, is a skater and she, uh, she won her first gold medal younger than I won my first gold medal at X Games, so she's a, she's a badass. Naming the old wife or girlfriend, Travis, always a safe bet. And how about Julianne Huff and Jennifer Aniston tied for most mentions? Now it's time to reveal my celebrity crush. It's not a driver or a movie star. He's actually a comedian. He has his own late night talk show. He's funny, handsome, and smart. Jimmy Fallon is actually my celebrity crush. Is it just me or am I blushing? Uh, I find him pretty irresistible. There is another Jimmy that I find irresistible. Jimmy Spencer, of course, and he is leading our hub picks heading into the off week after picking Clint Boyer last week. Spence, you got a nice lead, my friend. I'm not too far behind you. Ryan Newman got me a top 10 finish. Matt Clark is on my heels after picking the good old 48. And Bernsey, you have some work to do, my friend friend coming up from the rear take some time on this off week and come up with a good pick for Indy would you it's okay Danielle talk trash <laughs> the Bush boys hurt me two weeks in a row Kyle Bush had the ah, never mind what do you got Spence who's the man now Steve you are Jimmy. <laughs> Steve I'll tell you what I'm gonna explain how real race car drivers clean windshields next on the hub How to fill the rest of your evening, you ask? DVR alert, keep it on speed. Pastime follows the hub at seven, then an hour long Car Warriors at eight. At nine, back-to-back -back episodes of Wrecked. I'm not gonna use that line about Jimmy's career. At 10, it's Hard Parts South Bronx. Forget about. All right, Spence is back with us. Let's get started, waste no time. Tyler Johnson writes, the combo of Alan Gustafson and Jeff Gordon seems to be going south. With all the recent crew chief changes, do you think Jeff Gordon needs a new crew chief as well? Tyler, I'll be blunt. No way. Alan Gustafson is a hell of a motivator and a damn good crew chief. He revived Mark Warren's career. If you look at Jeff's season so far, he's had some of the fastest cars, but it's been bad luck that keeps him from running well. The two of these guys just need to have a powwow with Mr. Hendrick. If Gustafson left that 24 team, I think it'd be a huge mistake. Remember when Chad and Jimmy were at arms there? Mr. Hendrick made that right move, kept that pair together. Look at the results. That's when they had the milk and cookies meeting. Yes, sir. They were acting like children. Five times. Five times. All right, Bob Griffith from Anaheim writes, last year, Cousin Carl ran both the Nationwide and Cup Series and was a contender of both. This year, he's only running Cup and he's floundering. Jimmy, is there a connection? I think there is, Bob. Over the years, we've seen drivers have success when running the day before. Many think that the Nationwide Series is detrimental to Sunday's race, but some of the best used to run the both series. Bobby Allison, Dale Earnhardt Sr. When I was driving, I loved running both series. It's a way to build the confidence, know the track and the tire conditions before Sunday's race. If you look at the drivers who aren't running the Nationwide Series this season, like Carl, there's definitely a connection for some. Running Saturday will help you buy plants and shrubs. <laughs> Yeah, pay for jet fuel. Mm. Our last question is from Joey Smith in Broadnax, Virginia. He writes, I remember when a guy behind pit wall cleaned the windshield with a squeegee on a pole. Now all the teams <laughs> use tear-offs. How many tear-offs do teams get? And if they run out, can the crew clean the windshield the old-fashioned way? <laughs> you know something? I do remember those days of cleaning them windshields. Boy, it was awful. It was just never really clean. 
Then the manufacturers come up with that Lexan windshield. What a safety innovation that was. Afterwards, somebody came up with this idea of tear-offs. The pit crew incorporated the Jackman tire carrier to rip them off. But NASCAR does allow an extra man to service the driver when it's necessary. And naturally, he does the tear-offs. But if you ask me, Steve, we keep adding, you know, all these here crew people. And I think that these drivers should be cleaning their own windshields. Take a look here. Dale Sr. did this at Richmond. Now, you know what, Steve? That's a real yes, man. Yes, sir. <laughs> real man. Don't forget, Carl Edwards tried his own version in Canada. Uh, he was just squeegee. Come on, Steve. You know as well as I do, the man was Earnhardt. Nobody could ever replace him, baby. That's true. You know what? Uh, thanks a lot for a great week. I can't stop thinking about Rob Moroso. That was a great piece. Rob was a special person, and, and I, I think everybody loved his father, uh, Dick. All right. We'll be back to wrap the hub right after this. NASCAR Race Hub is presented by Mobile One, the world's leading synthetic motor oil brand, Mobile One, and brought to you in part by One and One My Website, where creating a business website is easy. Welcome back. Our Denny's Race menu for this weekend is all about the Chicagoland Speedway. We'll have Caping World Truck Series qualifying at 4 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. That's followed by the ARCA Racing Series at 5. Speed Center wraps up the day in motorsports at 7. The Truck Series set up with a fabulous Chris Devoto follows at 7.30. And the American Ethanol 225 goes green just after 8 p.m. Earlier this week, we told you that Phoenix, Martinsville, and Michigan had moved their Sprint Cup qualifying from Saturday to Friday. Today, Homestead Miami Speedway did the same thing, moving qualifying to 6 p.m. on Friday night of the Ford Championship weekend. Our thanks to Randy LaJoy and Jimmy Spencer for joining us, and of course to you for watching. Have an awesome night, everybody.